what's up everyone sam shot here founder of walsh mastermind and i'm excited to be back today with another client interview for you guys and today i'm really excited to have adam on with us and uh, adam is uh someone that we've been working with for oh geez i'm trying to remember when you started um you started with us back in like june of last year right and it's now february so for like the last eight months or so um and he's not your uh i would say not your typical uh, profile in, in terms of like someone who's trying to break into investment banking, but he was still able to kind of like overcome those challenges and successfully break in. Um, and so I just want to get him to come on here and, and talk to you guys about his journey. Um, and hopefully his story can serve as an inspiration for you guys and also just kind of help you, um, help you during your own journey as well. So uh, with that said, Adam, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to be here with us today. And if you don't mind, um, let's start off with like a quick introduction, like at a high level, it's like, you know, what's your background? where are you coming from? And just give us like your story in like a quick 30 seconds, maybe. Yeah, of course. So my name's Adam. I graduated from UT Austin this past uh, year in May of 2023. And um, I didn't really know that this was the career path I wanted to go down during college. So I would say like, I was a pretty, like Sam just said, I was a very late bloomer in that end. Um, so it was a bit discouraging for me earlier on um and we can get into like why I chose this career path later on but just to keep it short I I did figure it out uh pretty late comparatively to others I'd say but regardless um I did and um I'm from Texas and I was mainly recruiting for New York positions mm, okay so you're from Texas but you want to move to New York basically exactly yeah okay um which makes it harder obviously because I think like most people, even at your school, UT, even if they did recruit on time, most of them end up in like the Houston office doing like oil and gas as opposed to in New York, right? 100%. Yeah, there's like levels of the difficulty that the past few months that I've kind of been breaking it down that I had to kind of overcome each level. And uh, that was definitely one of them, which you just mentioned. Yeah, for sure. So you graduated in May of 2023. And at the time, you didn't have an offer in investment banking yet. Right. No. Nope. And you came you came to us in June, which is like basically right after you graduated. Yeah. Um, and so at the time, like what were you did you have another job lined up that you were about to start or what was the situation? Yeah, for sure. So I did have a job uh that I had lined up. It wasn't really relevant to investment banking though. It was a very niche type of consulting. Um I was lucky to get that job, but it just wasn't something that I was actively passionate in. Mm. Um so coming from the perspective that I had at the time, I I feel like investment banking was sort of a dream that I gave up on my early years of college. But as the years progressed, it was something like in the back of my mind that I wish I had done. So mm -hmm. it was something that I really wanted to prove to myself. And by the time I graduated, it was sort of like, I, like you don't talk to your friends who just graduated and hear them saying like, oh, I'm trying to like lateral into investment banking, even though I have a job in consulting. It's mm -hmm. just not really this thing that you hear. Even my friends who were in banking, they got their internships in the sophomore year. So like that was something that was very, very, very like past gone. And mm -hmm. um, it was kind of discouraging at the time because I didn't have anyone around me who was in that similar situation or I'd seen like break into it that late. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And I think that's like such an important thing because a lot of times when we decide whether we want to attempt something, we first need to have that belief that it's even possible because if we feel like, like mentally, if we feel like something's not possible or even like highly unlikely, then it's a lot harder for us to want to like put in the time and effort to even go for it. Right. For sure. yeah. um, so what made you decide to still go for it after you've already graduated and like something must have kind of like shifted your mindset right because you're looking around you no one's really trying to do what you, no one has really done what you're trying to do mm -hmm. so what made you kind of and actually like and, and also i guess um a semi-related question to that which is prior to coming to us in june like right after you graduate like <clears throat> had you already done some stuff on your own in terms of attempting to break into banking and and preparation and things like that or was this kind of like 
the very first time you really truly attempted? No, yeah, good question. Um, leading up to that point, I had known some people who had broken in, and those were the mainly the people who I would reach out to to talk. And at the time, like I didn't have all the knowledge that I had gained from you guys, so I didn't understand that talking to analysts doesn't really help. You know, like most of my friends were like a year or two older than me. They weren't in those positions, like associate positions or VPs or MDs that where they can actually like translate to like referrals or productive conversations. And the people like, you know, they always say like and at the end of every call, like ask if they can connect you with someone else. The people they would connect it, me with would be other analysts, mm. um, which in a way was good because like. I guess like it's always good to talk to people, but it wasn't productive, I'd say. Um, like one of the first calls that I hopped in with you guys uh, that really sold me on it was uh, leading up to it while I was doing research on the best ways to break in. Like, obviously, what looking back, it was probably such like the way I was going about it was like a waste of time. But I um, came across like y'all's target ads. And I think I filled out an interest form and then I hopped on a call with someone, one of y'all's reps, and they were telling me, they asked me the same question you are, like, what are you doing right now to uh, get on this grind? And I was telling them what I was doing and maybe I had converted into one referral for like an elite boutique. Mm -hmm. uh, and what he explained to me was like, right now you're probably working hard, but you're not working smart and you need to do both and you'll get that with us. And that's kind of what ended up happening. Like I was probably, I probably had the work ethic back then, the same work ethic I do with you guys right now, but it wasn't targeted at the productive things that would give me any return. Mm, gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. What were some of these things that you were doing? So it sounds like you were doing some networking on your mm -hmm. own already, yeah. but like mostly talking to like warm connections, people who are yeah. your friends from school who are maybe just first or second year analysts. Like li random LinkedIn DMs. Like yeah random LinkedIn DMs Did, had you done any like interview prep back then or not yet it was like very I I would like throughout college like I would cold apply to some roles and I would get the interviews but like I wouldn't really um like I wouldn't execute in the interviews like my my um walk me through your resume or tell me about yourself was not structured um, the way I answered my technicals, it wasn't the way that someone who comes from that background would answer it. It'd be like someone who just like is trying to memorize the guides. Mm. And, and uh, it was a very layman's perspective of it looking back. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. So you did like do all the standard things that most people do. Like you yeah. just study the guides, you memorize the answers. You kind of try to regurgitate those answers during the interview. Sometimes you didn't really understand what you were saying, but it was a very unstructured approach, I'd say. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so then you kind of started talking about this a little bit, but what was um like what made you ultimately want to join Wall Street Mastermind? Because yes, you want to like work smart, just not just work hard. But I feel like also a lot of times when people join, when people decide whether to join a program like this or not, um, in their head, they're making a decision on like, hey, if I join this program, do I think that this will give me the outcome I'm looking for? Obviously, exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but for someone like you, who's coming in, not as like the typical candidate who's maybe a freshman or a sophomore trying to recruit for a junior summer internship, like you're already graduated. Yeah. You're working in consulting. Yeah. Right. And you haven't seen anyone around you do what you're trying to do. Yeah. What gave you the belief that you could do this if you had our help? I honestly probably that I probably don't have like a very I probably don't have a strict answer to your question. If I'm being honest, like I kind of had to take a bet. Um, It was in a way like I can say that I was more confident and I can't say that I knew the answer. So I was more confident in the decision to go with you guys because um it was pretty clear cut the general uh skeleton that i was given of your curriculum mm. uh when it was explained to me it was something that i i resonated with and i kind of i'm like someone who believes like if you're gonna do something then like go 10 toes in you're not like what's the point of have asking it like why would i waste my time at this point of my career 
um you know if i really want to shoot the gun on this i only really have realistic realistically like a year to do it unless i get an mba which is like another wormhole right mm -hmm. which of things to consider like to applying to business school and then going through that cycle and whatnot so right. like if i wanted to like kind of cut in right now the the time frame for that was kind of waning and it was getting smaller and smaller so i kind of had to kind of shoot the gun on that and yeah I'm, like i can always like think i could have maybe done it by myself but it probably would have taken me like triple the amount of time because of the way that was doing my networking outreach like i didn't put as much emphasis on that end at all and um i probably like it paid dividends that in terms of like the learning curve of like how to go about it there's like a science between there's a science of yeah working and there's a science of getting this job and like i had no idea that that even existed yeah for sure um and did you have any like relevant work experience from back when you were in college when it comes to like banking or just finance experience I'd say like I had like uh, decently relative. I I would say like they're adjacent to finance, um, like investor relations roles. Like I did have one investment analyst role, but like nothing that was like strictly pertaining to like deal making and whatnot. Mm, gotcha. Okay. Um, did you have to like convince your parents to let you join this program, or did you just kind of do it on your own, or? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy story. Yeah, I actually, I I uh, didn't really ever tell my parents, actually, this is all like from me, you know, like, I this is something wow. that I wanted to do. And um, it was like an investment in myself. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. Major props for that, man. Because yeah, like a lot of people usually have to, um, you know, feel like they have to get their parents permission or sign off or whatever. And then like, once in a while, there's like a small minority of students like you who are just like, hey, man, this is my career you know yeah. what I want to do and I'm like whatever happens I'm the one who's going to have to live with the consequences okay. of like like either you're really successful well like you know or you're not and either way it's like you're the one that has to live that life not your parents yeah, right? yeah. Um, yeah and at least like if I if I do put my 100% in it and I fail like I can like sleep at night knowing I tried mm, yeah that makes a lot of sense it, basically you want to have like no regrets basically yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause I agree like a lot, especially like, dude, like I'm, I grew up, I'm I not grew up Asian. I am Asian. <laughs> and, and, you know, as are you. And like, you know, I know a lot of people who um, kind of live their life in a way where it's like, we're, we're conditioned to do what our parents want us to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like, I have a lot of friends who um, have to become doctors or engineers or lawyers or whatever. Just like all the, stereotypical professions that their parents thought was best for them and then now they're my age i'm 37 and they don't really like their job they're kind of miserable but that's the path that they went down because this is what they thought they were supposed to do and yeah. to me it's just like that's kind of a very miserable way to live right like you can't live your life based on other what other people want but you have to kind of live life based on like what you want for yourself right exactly that's, yeah that's what i always try to like encourage younger people to do because um I feel like when you're younger and you haven't lived that long yet, like it's hard to have that perspective, you know? Um, <clears throat> so I forgot to ask you this earlier, but <clears throat> here people are wondering like, what offer did you get? And, uh, well, actually let's start with that. Um, yeah, for sure. So, uh, I ended up getting an offer from CIBC. Uh, it's on their DCM team. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to know them throughout the process, like probably throughout all the banks that I got to network with and interview with, um, I really resonated with their culture. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Um, and what did it feel like when you got the offer? Because obviously this took like, what, about eight months, I want to say, right? And during this time, obviously you were already working full time. And on top yeah. of that, you had to network top of that you had to prep for interviews top of that you had to recruit and so i'm sure it's been like a really long grind for you and so like how did it feel when you finally broke through and got the outcome that you were working towards yeah so this was this was actually like an off cycle um recruiting process so i'm sure you know more about that than i do but for like like people who haven't recruited after like they graduate for lateral hires 
um, these interview processes can take four or five months sometimes because like they really want you to be a good fit. It's more like obviously they expect you to be 110 percent perfect in the technicals, but in the lateraling at the lateraling stage, um, like they don't need to take a bet on a like college internship or like a college like junior or sophomore when they're taking a bet like on a full time rec- or a lateral hire it's like a lot more higher stakes so they have a lot more specific um and there's also a lot of other things outside of what they want in an ideal candidate it's just like the hr process is also very long you know that's just how lateraling is especially the year that i was doing it in um you know it's no like surprised that it was a terrible year in terms of like trying to get a job in general but um they don't mind taking their time is what I'm trying to get at when it comes to a lateral hire so I would do like one or one interview I make the second round like a month later and then um obviously this every lateral cycle I feel like is very different um but it took this one a while I'd say so I'd say it was a little bit, to answer your question, it was a bit anticlimactic in a way when I did find out that I got it because like it had just been so long of just waiting to hear back. And obviously you want to be respectful of them when you're following up. Like you don't want to be that guy who's like cat, like following up with them every single day or every single week. So like I kind of be on the edge of my seat. But during that time, I kind of learned, I probably learned a lesson that I would have never learned, which is patience. Um, like I can only focus on I think I like you even told me this when I, I like sent you a screenshot of one of their responses. I was like, well, what do you guys think I should do? Like, should I follow up again? Like, what am I supposed to do? And you got I remember you said, like, just focus on what you can control on. In the meantime, like reach out to other people. Um, like, yeah, just focus on what you can control on. That's kind of what I learned throughout the process. So when I did actually find out, yeah, it was like really cool. And I was really happy because like, um, the person who was in charge of hiring me, uh, he was really stoked. Um, he thought I like performed pretty well in my interview process and the way I handled myself. So that part was really cool to hear that gratification. But in terms of like actually getting like an IB job offer, it probably didn't really like click in because it taken so long up to that point. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> yeah, that's crazy, man. Because <clears throat> now that I mentioned it, you're right. Not only were you recruiting for a lateral position, which is that, that there's no structure recruiting process for that. Like it's very ad hoc, right? Um, like they're not under like time pressure to hire you because for exactly. like junior summer internship recruiting, they're competing against all the other firms that are also doing yeah. junior summer internship recruiting. So they're trying to hire and fill their class as quickly as possible with lateral recruiting. Like there is no process um, or there's a process, but like, you know, there's no timeline that they're following and there's yeah. no time pressure. So they can take a long time. And now I think to make matters worse, you're right. Like you are pretty much recruiting throughout 2023, which is, you know, a pretty bad market from a job perspective. And usually <clears throat> lateral hiring is a lot easier during like a good market because yeah. when there's like too many deals and not enough people to do those deals, then they need to go out and hire laterals. But like when there's a down market and there's not as many deals, then there's less of a reason for them to hire laterals. Right. Mm-hmm. All right so that actually like drag things out for you for a really long time. Um, <clears throat> but I'm glad you handled it so well though, like in terms of like staying patient and just controlling the things that you can't control. Cause sometimes like, even though, I mean, we mean everything we say, but like sometimes even when we tell people, Hey, just control what you can control. Like they just can't help themselves. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, and it's easy to feel very anxious about like, Oh my God, who am I going to hear back or whatever? So, um, so let's talk a little bit about like what you actually did along the way that you feel like really made a difference for you and got you to this point, because I'm sure that's what like people are wondering about the most is like, okay, so you graduated you're working in this like niche consulting job yeah. and you have a little bit of, you know, maybe investor relations experience from college, but like nothing super like investment banking related experience. How does someone like you, like what did you do to go from that person to now working at CIBC, which I would say is a pretty reputable middle market bank. Like, I mean, it's one of the top Canadian banks certainly, but um, I would say top 50 globally. Um, mm-hmm. And so how did you go from that to breaking into a bank like this? What did you do along the way or inside of Wall Street Mastermind that you feel like really made, made a big impact for you? Yeah. Uh, how mm-hmm. much am I allowed to like go in detail about y'all's curriculum and what I did specifically? Like, just so I don't like say anything I'm not supposed to. Uh, I mean, feel free to say um, whatever you want, really. I mean, it's just 
you know, you don't have to like get super into the weeds, but you can talk about it at a high level in terms of like yeah. you know, two or three things that you feel like made the biggest difference for you. Cause I know like you have to do so many things, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I really think, I, I mean, the biggest thing was knowing how to get people's contacts and reaching out to them. And mm -hmm. um, that was, I'd say like, uh, the, that's the first part. And then the second part was how to conduct yourself in these calls, these mm -hmm. coffee chats and whatnot. Like it, it, that's really also a science, uh, the way like you kind of taught it was very structured and it taught it in different levels. And like, I think that that was really good for me to hear because um, even if the beginning coffee chats weren't that productive because I stuck to that structure, it became like a learning curve and um, it just kind of became second nature and hopping on those calls. I probably learned how to talk like these people because starting from June, spanning from June to like probably like even last month, like I was just hopping on so many of these calls mm -hmm. that I was only bound to talk like them, like the way they talked about deals, how, the way they talked about current events, what <clears throat> specific newsletters they read every morning. Um, there was just like an immense amount of like, um, I'd say, uh, I'd say there's just a lot of that information that I probably wouldn't have ever like been exposed to by hopping on those calls so I, that's like those are the two most important things was how to reach out to these people like how to find their contacts and then what to say on these calls because yeah even though not every single call uh converted into a referral um the information i learned from that like i was asking really good questions by the end like probably on every call i got at least one good piece of information that would help me on the next mm. yeah for sure um <clears throat> I think with just like anything else you do, um, networking is, it's like a muscle that you have to build. Yeah. It doesn't yourself. matter what industry. Yeah. And so it's like, well, the first time you go to the gym, you're going to be pretty awkward, like in terms of your posture and how you're lifting the weights and everything feels super heavy, but like the more reps you put in and the more sets you do, eventually you get stronger and stronger and it becomes it's muscle memory, right? It becomes second nature and you get better at it. And that's just kind of like a process that everyone has to go through on the networking side. But also at the same time, there's so much, like you said, like networking is a, there is a science to it. Right. Um, and unfortunately they don't teach you any of this stuff in school. I don't know why, cause it's a very important life skill, but um, they don't teach you how to do this stuff. So most people just don't know how to do it. And then, so in the beginning when you're doing it and you feel really awkward and you suck at it. And then like, you also don't know like why it's awkward or what you're supposed to be doing differently. A lot of people get frustrated. And then, so they don't do enough of it or they stop mm -hmm. prematurely. Right. Versus if you knew exactly what the best practices are, then even if things feel a little bit awkward in the beginning, you at least know like what you're supposed to be doing or how to go about it and what you're working towards. And so there is like more of a direction for you to be following so that you know, hey, if I just keep going, I'm gonna eventually get there. Right. Yeah. I, I would I have like an uh like a sheet where I take notes of all these calls and I just went back just to like see after I got my offer. I was like I looked at the notes from the first call and I remember the guy literally gave me pointers because it was such a bad and unproductive counterproductive call. Like he just gave me pointers on what I was supposed to say because he felt like I wasted his time. He was very blunt and looking back it was a good thing. And like by the end, I would be getting compliments on these calls, like, oh wow, like these are really good questions. And like some people would say like I was very ballsy or a badass for hopping on a call with them and being able to like hold a conversation like with them like the way I was. So um no, it was definitely really uh it paid dividends as well, like uh like having those connections, even though some of them didn't convert or like I didn't get a job at their firm or bank. Um it's definitely a cool connection to have. I think like another way of putting it is like every call, like none of these calls can be considered a failure mm -hmm. as long as you learn something from it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, you botched the call, but you got feedback out of it or you learned what not to do on the next call. And yeah. so it made you a little bit better for the next call. And you just keep repeating that until eventually you got really, really good where every single call was good. Like you said, right. Ah. 
For sure. Like I didn't approach it as if every call was an interview for a job. I approached it like every job, every call was an opportunity. Like it could give me a job or it couldn't, or it could like lead me to someone else. Like a lot of these calls, they couldn't help me. They straight up said they're not hiring, but they liked the way the conversation went so much that they connect me with someone they knew at another place or another place or another mm, place. Yeah. That's such a good um, reframe on your mindset and your mentality. Cause I think a lot of it is like going in with the right expectations, right? Mm. Because if you go in thinking like, Oh my God, like if I don't get a referral out of this call, then it's a failure, then you're going to be disappointed more often than yeah. not. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you're open-minded about this, just like opening up doors and opening up, opening you up to other opportunities, then it can very much be that, right? Yeah. Um, and especially as like a like an atypical candidate who's trying to lateral in, who's not like coming from really a finance background, um, unless you get really good at networking, there is no other way really to get in, yeah. right? Like the alternative is what you just apply to the jobs that you see online, and then like you don't talk to them, like. They're, they're probably not going to hire you out of all the people they could hire just based on your background and your resume because it's not as relevant as what they're typically looking for, right? Yeah, for sure. Me personally, like, um, not that cold applying is bad, but I just kind of gave up on that very early on. Um, mm -hmm. I just didn't see any yield from it. And I feel like uh, just the time I spent was like much more uh productive reaching out to people like that was kind of it and in, in terms of lateraling and i guess full-time hires i feel like that's kind of the name of the game yeah for sure how many do you did you track like how many people you ended up reaching out to or, or, like throughout this entire time and then how many people you actually talked to yeah yeah i did i like probably i stopped after a while but like i i, I think i stopped at 1100 contacts that i had emailed out um and then i hopped on calls with about like between 60 and 70 maybe yeah. um there was a bunch of mini calls that i didn't uh like record which i probably should have yeah. but the ones that i do have recorded it's like between 60 and 70 which i don't know if that's a very good conversion right now that i'm saying it out loud but it's a numbers game i guess right right i mean there's a lot of factors that go into the response rate right like some of it is like, um, for example, most people don't think about this, but the stronger your resume is or the more relevant of a background you have, probably the easier it is going to be yeah. to get on call with people, right? Or like you are from UT and you're from Texas, but you were trying to primarily network with people in New York, I assume, because that's where you want yeah. to go. Yeah. That's going to be way harder than like if you were yeah. primarily networking with people in the Houston office, you probably get a much higher response rate, right? And yeah. also you probably have a lot more alumni who are from your school, right? And so the everyone always asks like, oh, what's a good conversion rate? Well, like it depends. It's different for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Like your situation. That's yeah. That's a very good way to put it, yeah. But, but, but nonetheless, it's like, the reason why I asked you that question wasn't because, you know, I want people to think like, oh, like I got to get a conversion rate of X or whatever. It's like everyone's conversion rate is going to be different, but I did want to convey to people or give people a sense of the scale at which you have to network, because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people and probably yourself included before coming to this program, like you probably had no idea that you had to reach out to that. You were going to have to reach out to that many people yeah. before you got the job. Right. Yeah. Another factor I also take into consideration with that stat is in the beginning, I was kind of just reaching out to anyone. Um, but as I like learned, uh, as the process went on, I was trying to, I started to figure out who's more likely to respond and whatnot. Like someone from like Harvard or Stanford, uh, like not, not in the most respectful way possible is not going to respond back to me if they're like, um, yeah, from a cold email, like they're just not, cause they just don't have as many things related to me and whatnot like or the odds i don't want to say that they're absolutely not but the odds are much lower so i'd like find like relevant things between me and the person just on a glance of their linkedin profile and like later on i probably got much better conversion rate probably the last 500 con like contacts that i would reach out to like a lot more of that um ratio is probably tied into that 60 or 70 but yeah, it goes to say, like, you just got to keep doing it and you'll learn what, as the process goes on.
Yeah. And like, you know, a piece of advice for people too, is like, I think people always only just think about like the lowest hanging fruit. So they're like, oh yeah, I know I need to network and I got to reach out to alumni from my school. It's like, yeah. yeah, well, that's the most obvious first step or like the most obvious commonality you can go after. But what happens when you exhaust that list, right? Because again, as far as New York goes, you teach pretty much a non-target school. Yeah. So like, you're not going to have that many people from UT that you're going to be able to reach out to. Yeah. Right. And then so like, or maybe you like, like once you run out of alumni, um, what else can you do? Like you have to kind of get more creative, think outside the box, like maybe, okay. Um, and everyone's different, right? You have to think about your profiles. Like maybe I'm a non-target school student. Well, I don't have to just reach out to people from my non-target school. I can reach out to any banker that broke into banking from a non-target school. And then yeah. the commonality would just be like, Hey, I'm trying to break in from non-target school. I saw that you were able to do that successfully. So I would love to, you know, chat with you and get some advice. That's a commonality, right? You have to give them like a specific reason for why you identify them out of everybody out there that you could have possibly reached out to. And if you give them a good reason, they're going to be more likely to respond to you. Right. Um, another example would be like, if you, uh, like if you're in some organization from school, like maybe like I, I use myself as an example, like I was in a business for training called Alpha Kappa Psi. And Alpha Kappa Psi has chapters at a bunch of different schools across the country, right? They don't go to the same school as me, but I can go on LinkedIn and I can search Alpha Kappa Psi in the search bar and it'll show me a bunch of people that have Alpha Kappa Psi on their profile. And I can filter that by like what company they currently work at. And so I'll say Goldman Sachs and it'll show me like, I tried this before actually, it'll show me like 200 people that work at Goldman Sachs that used to be in Alpha Kappa Psi. And it's like, mm -hmm. now I can reach out to them and use that as our commonality. And again, that's going to help with conversion rate, right? So there's just some examples was like, some people use like ethnicity, right? Like, oh, like I can tell based on this person's name that we're from the same country, right? Yeah. Um, there's so many different things that you can do. Uh, and it's not just like, oh, uh, did this person go to my school, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, so, okay. So like, obviously networking is a huge part of it. Um, obviously you networked your butt off, uh, but even beyond networking, all networking can do really is get you the interview. Right? Yeah. Like if everything goes perfectly. Someone really likes you. They have an opportunity. They're hiring. They get you into the process. So you still, the other big piece is like, you still have to prep for the interview. Right. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us about your kind of like interview preparation process and how that went for you? And were you kind of starting from scratch or, I mean, obviously you've done a little bit of prep on your own before in terms of like memorizing the guys and whatnot, but like, what was the biggest difference this time around, I guess? Um, this time around was definitely my approach that was different. So I was probably focusing on the wrong things when I was interview prepping for interviews. I was like mainly focusing on technicals. Uh, I didn't really consider how strong my story had to be. Um, I really think that's kind of what set me apart from some other candidates mm. was kind of uh, like the way I told my narrative. Um yeah, I really think my story is what helped me sell myself in that sense. Mm. And another thing was like, as the rounds kept going, um, you know, I was like very well aware that I was not a special candidate in this cycle. You know, I'm not, I'm just being in the sense where like, I know that there's probably like, I knew what my odds were. Like there was a lot of other people who applied to this and there's probably hundreds of other um, or tens of other who were like interviewing so I just was trying to think of ways to set myself apart so I remember after like the first second third round um, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier I knew kind of how to speak like like the bankers in this team because of all the amount of people I'd spoken to throughout the summer like mm -hmm. what their views were on the market and interest rates and whatnot and like how like they would view what it's going to be moving forward so when I'd be asked these questions like it wasn't like a surprise to me like I knew exactly what to say and yeah. then um, there was this part that was like maybe like it, it was like a case or whatever and um like I I had learned this from a different interview process where it's like like the cases and modeling were like uh pretty straightforward but like I wanted to do something extra you know, like what, what, what can I bring that can set them apart, set myself apart. So like, I'd like answer them, um, like in a very different way, I'd say, than like the typical applicant, like add, add in the extra mile. Um, 
I just, yeah, I really think it was my approach. Like it was my story and like trying to set myself apart from the status quo kind of, because that's what you have to do um, as a lateral hire, in my opinion. That's like yeah. one of the things that they never process. That yeah. I mean, because would... ultimately like for lateral hiring, usually they're looking to fill like one spot. Yeah. Literally it was one spot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you're definitely not the only person going for it. And because there's only one spot, like it's very competitive. You have to literally beat out every single other person. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's mainly like you can't just, you, you, and you can't fumble. Like you can't fumble anything. Like your technicals, like um, the way you come across your behaviorals, there's a lot of room for error. And um, yeah, you, not to say that like perfect is uh, attainable. Like you can never be perfect, but um just like appearing like you're confident in your answers as well like that was yeah. like a big thing for me so how did you go about getting to that point where you can like not fumble with the technicals or even like have a story that um really felt differentiated and positioned yourself the right way like what was the process that you underwent to get to that point i guess yeah i mean like i i like I, I'm not to be corny, but I probably by at that point figured out why I actually wanted to do investment banking. And that's what helped my story a lot more. Like it wasn't like a bullshit story. So once I figured that out, I like ran it by a few of you guys. And like you guys give me very like unfiltered, candid, um, like critiques on how I could tweak it up and whatnot. And that was probably another like edge that I had was like, um, like I had inside of people who had actually done it before. And um, like, also my tell me about yourself answer, like anytime I'd hop on these coffee chats, like I was saying that anyways, like back then, like throughout the whole, like all these months. So when it came to interview time, it was kind of second nature. And like, I really, be like I, it seemed like I believe it, like, like it was like very second nature um and that's where that confidence I feel like came like it wasn't it wasn't like I had to think to be confident it was just like I just knew exactly what to say it was like a yeah. normal conversation and I think that's what they kind of um I think that's what most jobs would like for an interview to seem like a conversation could that where like you know what you're talking about what without being nervous at all yeah that's a really good point about networking too which is like the other benefit of networking a lot is you can almost treat it like a practice rep for actual interviews. It's like a low stakes way of practicing yeah. your delivery and your answers. Like if you mess up a networking conversation, oh, well, you can always exactly. have another one, but mm -hmm. you don't, by the time you get into the interview, because you've delivered your story so many times, it just comes out a lot more easier and a lot more smoothly. Right. And that does make a huge difference because your delivery is kind of what determines how confident you sound as a candidate. Yeah, for sure. Um, on the technical side, you said that you used to, when you first tried to interview in college, it would just be like, oh, you know, you memorized the answers and didn't really work very well. <clears throat> um, what was the difference for you this time? I guess. Yeah, um, definitely like the lessons that you guys had explained things like on a more like granular level so I had a deeper understanding of like the content um like it told me like what general areas to focus on and like yeah I'm sure like I probably could have learned that stuff on my own but um it was like the clarity and conciseness of which I learned it with you guys that I think helped a lot um like all everything online is so sparse like you read like all these threads on WSO or Reddit and there's just like a bunch of things that they tell you and like there's just too many things at a certain point and it was really good to have like tunnel vision like one source where everything you needed had to be so you just had to go to one place so yeah. I knew exactly kind of what to focus on and like from people like yourself who broke into it like explaining it for sure yeah I think like having structure and organization around the topics you need to learn is really yeah. important because also a lot of these topics have dependencies on each other. Meaning like if you don't learn them in the right order, then a lot of times something won't make sense because you like, you can't understand valuation without understanding the three statements first, for example. Right. Or like you can't understand 
an LBO without understanding the three statements first. But a lot of times people kind of like jump around in like a haphazard way. And there's like, Oh, well, I'm going to learn how to do a DCF. But before they do that, they can't even tell you like what free cash flow is. So it's like, that doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Right. And then like, when it doesn't make sense and you're just trying to memorize whatever, a bunch of text that has no meaning to you whatsoever. Like it's usually not going to work out very well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And I, I I definitely felt that way before I joined. Yeah. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, So I guess one last question for you, just because I know we're coming up on time here, but what would you say, like now that you've gone through this process and you're on the other side, um, what would you say is like the one piece of advice, maybe your best piece of advice that you have to share with people who are maybe still recruiting now or thinking about recruiting soon? Maybe someone who's, coming from like a less typical background, similar to what you're coming from, like, is there anything you learned or picked up along the way that you feel like really helped you that you want to kind of share with other people? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I feel like, um, I think it's funny because I usually ask people that on these coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been asked it myself, but um you're on the other side now, man. <laughs> I feel like it was, um, I know this is going to sound very simple, but to have like patience in yourself and like confidence in that patience, like um, if it was, I think like you've said this uh, in some of your videos online or whatnot, but like if it was easy, then everyone would be doing it. Like there's a mm. point, there's a point why it's stressful. And I think like in a way you kind of have to, what I mean by patience is you have to accept or like kind of um, have somewhat of a joy in the process, because if you ever interview against someone who does enjoy the process, then you're probably going to lose to them. Mm. Like if you're just doing the process just to do it and get over it and get like, yeah, and just do it like and you run into someone who actually like fell in love with the process and ended up like liking this line of work and the art of like really like like fighting for this job then you're probably going to lose to that person Mm. Um, and that's what I kind of mean by patience I know that's like not the what you would ideally think about when you think of patience but yeah because like you 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 gotta kind of have that blind faith I love that um I've asked this question many many times to different uh students that we've interviewed and this is a pretty unique answer that I don't think I've ever heard before. And so that's really cool. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I think of um, like my favorite basketball, I mean, I'm a Bay Area guy, but, Bay Area guy, but like my favorite basketball teams, the Warriors, obviously. And yeah. you know, Steph Curry obviously is the biggest star on that team. And he always plays with like this joy, uh, mm-hmm. like, like this, like this joy for the game, like win, lose, doesn't matter like he he just loves what he's doing right he loves like perfecting his craft and um, I think that people that do well in life are like of course you want to set goals right and but I think most people when they set goals um, their goals are like the outcome that they want so for example my goal is yeah like my like my my goal is like I want to get this offer okay but like a lot of times the goals that people set are like things that they don't have a hundred percent control over. Yeah. Whereas like, if you just set your goal, so you're, instead of setting your goal as the output, if you set your goal as the input, which is the part that you actually do have control over. Like, for example, if I say my goal is like, I have to get a referral at Goldman Sachs. Okay. Like you don't have complete control over that because you're not the one who like gets to decide if you get a referral or not. Like that's the banker. Right. But what you can control is like, how many people am I going to speak to from Goldman Sachs this month? Mm-hmm. Right? And if you hold yourself to that, like that's the first step, right? Yeah. Like you do that with patience and uh, consistently over time, eventually the, the end goal or the output that you want it to be the goal that will come. Yeah, right? exactly. Like I read this book where it said um, like, people who have big goals like they're kind of even though they work hard they're bound to kind of 
set themselves up for failure in a way because they don't have like the the stepping stone goals to get there and mm-hmm. I feel like as I kind of went by like probably from the beginning I that was my goal to just have an offer you know I'm not gonna lie to you it obviously was but like if I could like go back and like understand wow I actually did learn a lot in month one or month two or month three like that I should probably keep in mind for other things there's like a bunch of things I learned that aren't even just related to this field there's probably like I feel like I can do I I feel like if you gave me six months to get any job I could do it now because of all the many like accomplishments I made on the way yeah I think the thing you said about like finding joy in the process is also like it's not even about the end destination anymore. It's about going through the process and like who you get to become along the way because you're putting in the work. Right. Um, And because you're growing, you're learning, you're like learning new skills and how to do these things. And like you said, some of these are life skills that you're going to be able to use for the rest of your life. Right. And then, and then I think the, the, the other thing that I really liked about what you said is that, that reframe around, yes, recruiting is stressful. Yes. Recruiting is hard. Um, but that's because like nothing good in life really comes easy. Right. Because usually the best things in life are like the things that everybody wants Mm -hmm. and the things that everybody wants, like, it's going to be more competitive. It's going to be harder to get. That's why not everyone can have it. And if like, every time, like something feels hard, um, a good reframe that I personally use all the time and that I like is like, that's great. I'm glad it's hard because that means I know that most of my competition they're not going to do this and they're going to give up but i'm not the type of person that's going to give up and so that's actually advantageous for me in the long run as long as i just stick to it yeah someone on one of these calls told me in lateral recruiting a lot of the times it's just matters who's the last one standing it doesn't even sometimes mean like who's the best one standing it's like the last one who is willing to like go through it yeah for sure for sure Good stuff, man. Um, uh, I'm really happy that, uh, you know, you were able to share that with kind of just our audience. I think it's really going to help um, the people that got to hear that advice. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. But um, yeah, so for for those of you who are, you know, still with us, um, you know, if you find yourself in a similar situation, maybe you're trying to lateral into banking from another field. Maybe you already recently graduated. You're not the typical candidate. Um Maybe you even have like a little bit of doubt or just lack of belief on whether this is even possible or not, because quite frankly, you don't really know that many people or anybody around you who's done what you're trying to do. Um, I want to encourage you guys to just like reach out to our team. You can schedule a free call with us. Just have a chat. Tell us more about your profile, your background, your situation, what you're trying to accomplish. Where do you feel like you're getting stuck? And based on that, we'll just, you know, do our best to give you our advice and our um, opinion on like, how you could go about it, if it's even possible, what would you have to do? Um, and based on that, like you can make a determination yourself. Like, is this something that you feel like is worthwhile? And if it is, do you need help doing it? If you want our help and we feel like we can help you, we absolutely, you know, we'll love to do that. If you feel like it's not something that's worth doing, then Hey, no worries. Like you don't have to, so now to do this, there are other jobs out there that you can pursue. Um, but at a minimum, you know, you owe it to yourself to just find out as much as possible about it so that you can make an informed decision because ultimately at the end of the day, it is your career, which is probably one of the most important things for you to get right. If you want to, um, you know, just live a really happy and fulfilling life. Right. And so if you guys want to do that, feel free to reach out to our team. You can do that by going to www.wallstreetmastermind.com slash apply. The street is abbreviated to ST. So it's wall ST mastermind.com slash apply. And then you can, um, schedule a time with us there. And then, uh, we look forward to talking to you guys. All right. So with that said, um, Adam, I want to thank you again for taking so much time out of your day to talk to us. Uh, really enjoy this conversation. And again, super happy for you. Um, really proud of you really for just sticking with it, going through a really tough and grueling process, probably even harder than what most other people had to go through just to break into banking. And uh, at the end of the day, I can tell you have a really good head on your shoulders and you have like just a level of maturity to you, I want to say. Um, and I can tell you're really going to do well and go far. And I'm excited to see, uh, you know, where this takes you. So thanks for uh, letting us play just a very small part in your success. No, thank you guys for playing that part. I appreciate it. It's not, it wasn't a small part at all. Like it, it helped a lot. So, uh, you no, know, it means a lot, all those words and all the help as well. Yeah, man. I appreciate you for saying that. And, uh, guys, we're gonna, you know, wrap it up here, uh, for this episode and, uh, we'll be back with more of these for you guys in the near future. But, uh, 
you know, until next time. All right.